Well, do we have any prayer requests now? Um, I have a prayer request for a family who's been burned out over the last couple of days. I'm not exactly sure when the fire was, but huh. I know it's been in the last couple of days. <clears throat> it, and, and you won't believe this, they're related to Marva. Really? Yes. Oh. Related to who? Marva, the lady who's uh, lost three people. Oh. Um, and their last name is, I think it's Snyder. Anyway, um, it's a man and his wife, and I don't know if they have any children up there, but I know there were several, there are several foster kids living with them. Hmm. So I uh, reached out to um, Dwight, but he hasn't responded yet. I wanted to see, you know, if there's anything before I call this lady and say, hey, we might have some furniture. I would think there would be a lot of people here with, that would be willing to try to come up with things needed. Yeah. There, there still is furniture. Okay, well, see, I not, a, not as you, you would have to ask Dwight as far as like what specific, like we gave away a lot, yeah, um, back in December, but there is still a considerable amount over there, okay. And yeah, there's also chairs and a bunch of like um, dishware and stuff like that downstairs. And then the Good Samaritan has a ton of like sheets that they actually somebody donated to them that we could, uh, they actually have like a, for that specific instance, like if you experienced a fire, it's like a kit's not the right word, but they've got all kinds of stuff together that they give to those, you know, uh, but yeah, so. Like the blessing buckets. Yeah, yeah, essentially, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, there he is. Uh, let me know if you don't hear from Dwight. I'm okay. Wrangle them up too. Um, well, I hate to hear that. Any other prayer requests? And of course, I'd like for everybody to remember Bill. Yeah. I've got, well, I mean, there, there are several. I mean, also the family of Lois McCullough, obviously, and then um, continue to remember Shirley Roy as well, um, with the loss of her daughter. And then uh, Meredith Hayes, Meredith, Meredith Elliott, um, has a, what they believe is a cyst on um, an ovary um, that's causing her a lot of pain. And they're going to go in on the 25th in Charlottesville to remove it. Mm -hmm. um, so they, like I said, they believe it's just a cyst, but the doctor said, you know, until they get in there, they don't know. So, but um, she's got that a week from tomorrow. So just continue to remember her and Donna, especially too. Donna's going to go up there. They're, they think it'll be outpatient unless something unexpected occurs. So, and then I also heard today, um, Gabby Bridgers has breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Wow. So she had a biopsy yesterday and she's supposed to get the results back tomorrow, but the doctor told her that it was malignant, he felt sure, and that it's just kind of, you know, I mean, there are different types of breast cancer. So um, she should know more tomorrow as to what, what time. Ellen um, Moore, secretary. Mm -hmm. So. Anyone else? Rich Wilson. Rich, yeah, Rich. And Dora Stuffleton. A lot of hurting people. Yes. Well, let's let's pray. Most gracious God, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, Lord, another opportunity to be your people. God, we just pray, um, Lord, for this church, Lord, and its many members, especially those who are going through difficult times, Lord, whether they're sick and hurting or whether they're facing adversity at home or at work or whether they've lost loved ones recently, Lord, we just pray that you would remind them of your grace and your mercy and your love in special ways, Lord. And we just pray that as their church, we would step up. Um, Lord, to be the body that they need us to be, to support them, to encourage them, lift them up in prayer, Lord, and serve them in any way that we can. God, we pray especially, Lord, for Shirley Woolby, for Doris Stubblefield, Lord, as they both experience the loss of a daughter.
God, we just pray that you would give them comfort in their grief, Lord, that you would let them know that they don't experience this loss all alone, that there is an entire church here to support each of them through this. God, we pray also for Gilda Hall, Lord, that you would continue to be with her and to give her body rest and healing, Lord, that you would give her an appetite, Lord, so that she can eat, to build up strength and to be able to go back home where we know that she wants to be. Um, God, we pray also for Rich Wilson, Lord, that you would continue to be with him and Lavetta, Lord, and that you would just um, give him peace of mind, Lord, and assurance, Lord, and comfort just during this difficult time. Um, God, we pray also for the family of Lois McCullough, Lord. We pray for Charles and Lisa and Tiffany, Lord, during this difficult time. Um, Lord, we just pray that they would feel your presence and your love in a special way in the days to come. Um, God, we just pray for the family that, that lost their home to a fire, Lord, that you would surround them, Lord, with those who care for them and love them, that this community would um, rally around them to support them during this difficult time. Um, God, and we just know that there are so many other people in our church and in our community and all across our world who are struggling, who are hurting, Lord, who um, could use encouragement and support, Lord. So we just pray that as your people, we would be attentive to the many needs that surround us, Lord, and that we would always be willing um, to do whatever we could to help others in their time of need and to share your love with them through our actions, Lord. And we just pray that as we turn our attention to this book, Lord, um, over the next few minutes, Lord, that you would just move among us um, as we seek to be a church that's welcoming and warm and inclusive towards young people and young families. Lord, we just pray that you would give us a passion and a desire to reach out to the young people in our community and in our congregation and to let them know of your great love for them. And God, we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, so we are wrapping up Growing Young tonight. Um, and, you know, for the last good bit, we've been going through each of the six, what they call them, strategies or principles, I guess, strategies. Um, and tonight was more of a, how do you put it all together, Jack? So Growing Young in your context. So I um, actually really enjoyed, I think this might've been one of my more like favorite chapters that I think we read. I'm, I'm not sure why, but I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I enjoyed how it was kind of bookended by two different examples of two very different churches that did grow young. Um, and I especially liked and appreciated really how both of them were stories about how it was a church that was growing old and had reached this pivotal point where things didn't look very good um, and it was really that, 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 you know, acknowledging where they were at and the difficulties ahead of them that motivated them to change, right? Um, I think the acknowledgement is the hard thing for right. some churches or some people within a church. Absolutely. And, um, but it's so important that yeah. things cannot stay as they are. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, like, I mean, just the world changes. I mean, I, you know, I told a story probably my first few months here in a sermon one time about a, I interviewed at a church um, and it was for an associate position and the pastor was like showing me around the building and we went in their library which was like their meeting room too and it had all these you know portraits of former ministers and then there was this portrait of the church and Main Street came right from downtown across it was in Elkin, North Carolina across the I guess it's the Yadkin River right by the front door of the church. Well, what was really interesting about that picture was that when I drove through downtown Elkin, there was no bridge that took you from downtown across the river to the church. Like that road wasn't there anymore. And I remember that minister saying that that church's greatest challenge was that they were still operating as if, you know. It was easy to get from one place to the other. Well, it was, well, it was like that was, you know. Elkin had changed and that like Main Street wasn't bringing people to First Baptist anymore and hadn't for 30 or 40 years and that, you know, they were still operating as if that was their church and it, it wasn't anymore. And like they, had, they, you know, they were neglecting the fact that the community had changed and they needed to change with it. Um, and, you know, I think that that's a, the situation a lot of established Main Street churches face, really, you know, I mean, I don't think it's unique to us or to that church or um, 
I think it's what you know probably a the majority of congregations now are facing. But um, but yeah. Well, what what stood out to you from this chapter? Well, they did say on that very first page, growing young is not optional, it's essential. Yeah. And I think that is very true for our church as well. Otherwise, you look in 10 years, who was, what, what's left? Yeah. Well, yeah, even when you get to, to the second page on 272, talking about what happens if a church does resolve to grow young. And so this was a, like a Catholic church, they're talking about two thirds of the way down, but, it, but they got right to work. You know, they were had somebody who was working on the campus that was nearby that could encourage people to come, new activities, Sunday evening mass, midweek gatherings. Slowly, younger people started to re engage. So it, it starts with that plan. And I and I throughout the chapter, they give a lot of ideas mm -hmm. that you could use to do different things, you know, and, and of course we'll talk about some of those things later that they say it's essential to do this, yeah. this you know, but, but it's like, you've got to start somewhere because if you don't start somewhere, you won't get anywhere. Right. And, um, like they say on the 273, that second paragraph, growing young was not easy. It took a significant time investment from the young and the older parishioners. And they did talk about sometimes the church felt split in two. So you can see that um, you could have a church that felt we're doing just fine as we are. We don't need to, blah, 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 you know, and other people, but if we don't, we won't. Right. Um, and so you can see that any change, as we know, some people don't like. Um, so there are challenges, but to not get started is the worst of all. Right. I think. I just, I just think it's difficult <clears throat> trying to figure out where this church in this location in this town like fits in because it's not an urban church even though it's on Main Street and near the little downtown, but I still certainly don't call this urban. Yeah. So it's not like this St. John's Catholic Church that was in Indianapolis or wherever it was, which had like a huge college campus to tap into. Well, and I also thought- We don't have that, you know? I also thought that, that I'm sure there was another very interesting story that wasn't told about how Father Rick ended up serving as going from campus chaplain to lead, you know, like that. <laughs> There was probably that, that I'm sure that wasn't a smooth transition either, you know, like, so, I mean, it was very interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, Sarah, I think that's an interesting point. So, you know, we don't fit in the urban category, but we also, you know, where we lived before we went to country churches, which there's plenty of those in Halifax County. And that's a whole different dynamic, but they were active and thriving, but in a different way. Yeah, I mean, the one every, once a month, the men in the church did like a, a country breakfast from like eight to 10 on a Saturday morning. And it was sort of a thing like that baseball movie, Build It and They Will Come. It's like they decided they were going to do it and they put a banner out and it was, you know, a four lane, like 360. The church was on a four lane highway way out in the country put the banner up in the first week they did it, you know, people from church came, but you know, maybe there was 20 people, but they kept faithfully, you know, the third Saturday of every month, they kept doing it. And before long, the social hall, which it was much smaller than ours, fellowship hall was capacity of a hundred, I think, was so packed and would have people waiting to come in. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how much that grew yeah. as a as a community thing that they did. And they didn't charge money for it either. Well, 
they had a basket and if you wanted to put money in, you could, but if there were people that needed to stop and eat breakfast, they could and they didn't have to. Yeah. It wasn't like $8 a head or something like, mm -hmm. like some fire halls and people do. The point is, it's just, you know, a country church can do certain activities. You know, they, they had a big Christmas bazaar, they called it every year. That was just, people waited for that all year. And it used to be packed as well. So it's just hard. I, I, I find it hard to put my finger on where, you know, the size of South Boston and the location of the church, like who you tap into, because if kids are going to a four-year college, then they're going away to college. They're not here. Yeah. Some and go they don't, to they the don't typically move back after they're done with school. And they usually we have a number that do the community college locally, but it's not like you have a big campus that has a they're not living campus. on campus where you could, you know, tap into that. And so, I mean, most college kids, so sure. if it has anything to do with food, they're going to be interested <laughs> because, you know, if, if, if they're like I was, you know, especially free food, if it's free, if it, yeah, if you find out somebody's serving a home cooked breakfast, you know, that's, that's a good thing. But yeah, it's not a, it's not a campus with dorms or anything yeah. like that. So it's hard once they get out of the reach of Matt and the high school, it's, I've just been trying to think like how do you tap into the 20 somethings, you know? Yeah. Cause it's not like they're all in one place. No. <laughs> and the 30 somethings who have gotten out of the habit mm -hmm. or maybe never had the habit. Yep, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, I did love the examples, but, and there's things you can glean from them that would be interesting to to try here but you know there wasn't one that was like oh wow that's just where we are yeah well i do think it's important i mean i think you raise a very important point sarah i think you have to you have to know your community and know you know demographically who's out there and, and what what do they need but then also like what are they interested in mm -hmm. um and you know what what works in one place isn't going to work in another um and you know i mean i this is a weird thing to say when you're talking about growing young but like we part of last week talked about some where well, we didn't look we didn't talk about it but we we looked at the census data for halifax county right. and and if one thing is we're an older county um you know like i mean actually like 65 and above is a, a bigger percentage of our county than 25 and below um, by a not significant matter. So like, I think, you know, two, do we need to grow young? Absolutely. But like, if we want to be faithful to this community, we also need to figure out ways to reach out to that, you know, um, demographic as well. Um, and those are probably going to look like two very different things, right? You know. Um, well, it's mentioned about St. John's that it was an older congregation and then they started getting young people from the university coming. You know, they, they worked to do it, but I think it says on 273, too often, however, the church felt like it was split in two. It still felt like, well, here's the older people that have always gone here that kind of do their thing. And then we have this growing, you know, youth attendance, which is great, but like the two weren't really interacting yeah. and they had to work at figuring out ways yeah. for that to happen my home church went through that we had two services so a contemporary one and a traditional one obviously like a lot of young people went to the contemporary one and most of the older members went to the traditional one and um but never the twain shall meet right well that <laughs> but that but then also what what ended up happening was it well who who's paying the bill so to speak well it was the older you know, in the, the traditional service, really. 
And it got to the point where that was like a point of resentment that built some tension in the church was that, well, it's the older members that are really keeping the doors open, tithing, supporting the church. But like everything we're doing is going towards the younger people. And like the, the older people resented that. And it created, it was uncomfortable for a number of years until they figured out a way to navigate that. Um, gee, that's it. interesting to think about. Well, I think it, you certainly don't abandon the programs this church already has going on. Right. You know, like the teenagers going on to plays and, and dinners and things together or, you know, other things that are for the older members. I think that's the fear a lot of them feel like they're just going to be kind of yeah. left in the background. Well, I, I wonder, and we've talked about this um, too, you know, I think one reputation, one good reputation that our church has in the community is our strong music program. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like if you ask Chastity, how did her family end up at First Baptist? Chastity would tell you that her girls were going to the weekday school and Susan was doing children's choir. And, you know, there was an invitation made for anybody in the weekday school to participate if they wanted to in children's choir. And Chastity would tell you, you know, that at the time, there really wasn't anywhere else in the community where their girls could go to some program that was free that would teach them how to sing or to be a part of the choir. So they went. And Chastity being Chastity, you know, was not going to send her girls there without coming herself, right? And then it turns out that she recognized Susan really needed some help, um, you know, as far as with all these kids at one time and, and trying to lead them in the choir. And that's how they ended up here. And you wonder, like, how many more kids like that there are in the weekday school that you know, their parents probably do want them and the kids probably want to participate in something like that. They like to sing. They would like to perform like that. Um, we already have this reputation in the community of, of being this church that has a wonderful music program that's central to our identity. To me, that's a natural extension of that in a way that helps us grow young, right? And, and maybe you wouldn't be able to get some of these families into the church just by inviting them, hey, please come on this Sunday. But they would like their kids to sing and they would certainly come if their kid was invited to perform, right? Like that's a, that is a, to me, that's a, a good segue into coming more than that one time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, we talked about um, inviting the things. Has that been discussed with Mary Tucker? And so you're going to have to say. Talking about. Um, like having them do having, it. Having, the weekday kids in class or yeah, two oh, yeah, at a time yeah. coming to do like, yeah. a poem or a song or yeah I think they would be all for that yeah um, so, I mean we want to that's one of the things that we might want to roll with as an early thing if we're going to try to I mean there's there's some things they talk here that every you know you need to do this you've got to do this yeah but in the meantime before we start doing this or at the same time <laughs> we'd love to have one group a month or whatever, yeah. you know. Yeah, uh, I think they would be more than, I think they would be very receptive. And I that. think that's something we could roll on with right away. Yeah, and I think too, like, you know, like we've mentioned it too, like if we're going to do something like that on Sunday to do some type of, like have some kind of um, reception, maybe a, even if it's like a kind of informal reception where you can, you know, there's something for their parents and grandparents, you know, where we could also, you know, go and tell them what a good job they did and how glad we were to have them with us. And, you know, there's information about the different programs we have going on for their kids, you know, throughout the week. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, well, on 275, of course, those six core commitments that the church, the church, St. John's Church, they were talking about. Yeah. That, everybody needs to try to do and that's this is what they did so certainly those six commitments are worth just looking at it in yeah the key chain leadership you know that but a lot of people having some leadership roles empathizing with today's young people developing relationships with them and that's sort of we have talked about that idea before about being sure that we speak to young people who come. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, you're there and you do your thing. But, and I think First Baptist has gotten really good 
about going and speaking to people who were visiting. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, yeah. we want to be sure people remember the young people as well. Taking Jesus's message seriously, fuel a warm community, prioritize young people and their families everywhere, and be the best neighbors. So certainly things to think about, but um, trying to share some things on Sunday morning with different groups. So it's not the same ones doing yeah. the same things and that somebody getting a chance to speak a little and yeah. hopefully that will make them come more yeah. when they see it's something different. You know? you know, what do you think? I thought one thing that was really interesting, it spends a lot of time talking about it, was like the, the place of story, you know, like knowing the church's story. I mean, yes. it gets into detail, but like one thing I thought was really interesting on 278, the last sentence of the first full paragraph, I guess it's really the second paragraph, the full paragraph, just the sentence, um, where it says, of those young people and adults who knew the history of their church, more than one third reported that their church had undergone significant change to become more effective with their young people. Um, you know, so like, I think naming that, I mean, you know, I think I've said this before, but if you've existed as a congregation for 140 years, you have experienced your fair share of significant challenges you've probably changed significantly over the way. Like that, that is part of your story, right? And that as you embrace a new challenge or as you recognize the need to make what isn't an insignificant change, like there should be some narrative that you can build from about how that, you know, actually what we're doing now is part of our history, right? Like, you know, it, maybe it feels like we are doing something new and we're changing our identity, but, but the act of doing this is in keeping with who we are as a congregation and why we still find ourselves here 140 years later, right? Um, there have been many different generations of young people and some yeah. of those young people are now older people. Um, yeah, um, and it talks about in here too, which is something that we ran into, I ran into it more at my church in Greensboro, about how you have normally older members that have probably been, some of them have been members of your congregation for 30 or 40 years, some of them have been members of their entire lives. And that there, there were all these programs or events that were deeply meaningful and formative to them. And that part of the challenge of change is that they are very hesitant to get away from those programs because they were very meaningful to them over the years, but also because they think that, well, if, if young people would just give those programs a chance, it would have the same impact on them, right? And maybe in some cases that is true, but like the tricky work is that what we're trying to pass down is not necessarily the program so much, it's the impact the program had. And that you have to be able to recognize that sometimes if you wanna create the same impact, the answer isn't to keep trying the same program, it's to recognize that some things have run their course and you have to try something new. Um, and like we, I mean, the example of my church in Greenfield was that we had Wednesday night supper every Wednesday night. <laughs> They wanted young people to come, but at the same time that like, you know, the people that were in charge of the, the supper were like trying to figure out how to get young people to come. They also thought that supper started too late, that they were hungry. So they decided that supper should start at 445. <laughs> so like, you know, so it's on the one hand, like, no, you know, that's not gonna work, right? But like it was, we, we spent so much time and energy trying to keep Wednesday night suppers alive that we really couldn't extend the energy we needed to do other things, right? And like, it was like, that was, it was so hard to figure out the diplomatic way to have those conversations. And like, how do you help people recognize when something has run its course and it's okay to let it go and trust that there's something better that God's got in store, you know? Um, but yeah, but then, I mean, I just, I thought the part about the story, like the, you know, tapping into the story of the church and recognizing that now it's our time to continue writing this story. Um, to me, that was very interesting. Um,
also on page 278, the next paragraph after the one you just read from, um, I thought a very important sentence from this whole chapter was, young people's energy, excitement, and passion can electrify churches and propel them forward into a more hopeful future. Um, and, and, and something that I've seen, and of course, you know, I, I talk a lot about choir. That's a very dear thing to me. But, you know, having Sarah and Emily join the choir and Beth join the choir, you know, some younger people. And, you know, I really have not thought about it when I've seen Susan, but, you know, I think it would be good for us to try to get, um, who's the young girl that's in your thing? Candace. Candace. I think it would be good to invite Candace to come to the choir. I think, you know, the Anybody more from that um, generation. Youth, that middle, mm -hmm. like the 13 up, you know, if they can sing and read music, then come on. And, and they like to sing, they, yeah. We had, um, it was a larger church that I grew up in and we had two services every Sunday, 8.45 at the youth choir sang in and 11 o'clock at the adult choir sang. Mm -hmm. And when it was cantatas that we learned it too and we sang with them, everybody sang two services then. But their youth choir sang every single Sunday. And that I'm sure instilled so much in us to continue. And yes, I agree that I think young teenagers on up, if you can sing or will help you learn how to read music, whatever, come on. Yes, I, I think I think we should too. Yeah. Some of them sing better maybe than some of us. <laughs> <laughs> <Some of them. laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I just think that it again it's the inclusion of all different groups. Yeah, you don't have to be 40 plus. Yeah, you know, or of course, right now we do have um, Sarah who's younger. Um, but yes, yeah. a 16 year old, we know 16 year olds that have fabulous voices. You know what I'm saying? Yes, any teenage age coming on up when you hit that youth thing, come on. Yeah, so maybe that's something we need to talk to Susan about and, and then put it out there. And yeah. we'd love to have you on. Well, let's, uh, let's skip ahead a little bit. I want us to look, there's some, a pie chart on page 291 that I thought was really interesting. Um, so essentially, I think they polled some, maybe it was pastors, I guess, or, or leaders. Uh, what was the greatest challenge facing their congregation in reaching young people? Um, you know, what were their, the biggest obstacles in their way? Um, and I thought it was very interesting that the largest percentage, by not an insignificant amount, was their own congregation. Like their, their, their own congregation was the biggest hindrance for them to being able to reach. Um, and then like, you know, they broke that down into seven different things. And the number one was a generation gap. Number two was inconsistent or non-existent volunteers, lack of strategy, lack of material resources, lack of willingness to change worship style, and then other generations assume the worst about young people. Um, that generation gap ties in with worship style, lack of willingness to change. Yeah. All, especially those tap into each other or number seven also, perhaps. Yeah. Um, right. There are people that don't want to change the music, that don't want to change. There were people who complained about the wonderful young man we haven't had for a while from uh, from Roger, Roger, Roger. Plays the, yes yeah. um, plays the guitar and uh, violin mm -hmm. that say people complained about him I did not know that. because um, because he, he put a little more soul yeah. into you know, like he would do some stuff. Oh, I thought he was wonderful. Oh, I, I agree. I could have just listened to him every single Sunday, and I would love for him to come back yes. um, in summer when maybe she's looking for someone to do something special like they do in the summer. I, I hope she will tap into him again. He was wonderful. I thought so too. I didn't know anybody complaining. It wasn't many. It wasn't many. <laughs> <laughs> I had this conversation with somebody earlier today that sometimes they've got to remember some people just really like to complain. So, yes, 
I, yes. I think that it's a, a practice and patience and grace sometimes to assume that maybe they don't actually think what they're saying. They just kind of want to be a contrary. Yeah, you know, yeah. so. And I think um, it wasn't the violin so much as the guitar. Yeah, no, it was definitely the guitar. Yeah. So it was interesting. And, but, and I loved it when Mary Maloney played her trumpet. Yeah. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Well, I thought, I thought that this was, so, you know, in our congregation, like what are the greatest challenges within our congregation that maybe make it difficult to grow young? or, you know, make the work a little bit harder. wonder if you guys had thoughts on that. Well, I just think people who are stuck in what a worship service should be like. You know, it has to be this, 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 this and this. this. change. Yes. Yeah. Adults, 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 adults. And you better do the same thing. We have to wait. <laughs> but that causes people to lose interest and you're not going to attract people who say like, wow, this is really, different this is neat not that you have to do radical things different but shake it up a little bit yeah. and include like we say include young people and different types of music so it's not always the same yeah i think the inconsistent or non-existent volunteers which i know we're having that issue with nursery and children's church and i know i've just heard this many times from um well it's usually most of the time it's women that keep the nursery and oftentimes it's women or maybe a cup married couple that will do children's church but they'll say i did my dash like i raised my kids and i volunteered then and took my turn and i did all the things and now I'm 65 or I'm 70 or whatever. I don't feel like dealing with, you know, wrangling a bunch of kids that are running around and keeping them under control or making them pay attention or trying to do a project. Like, I'm, I don't wanna do that anymore. You know, I've heard that a lot of times. They're like, no, you know, younger people should take their turn and do it. I'm too tired. I can't keep up, yeah. you know, or they just can't, you know, I don't know myself, like, like last night at, at the youth. Um, and I was only there for less than an hour, maybe an hour. And, you know, the room echoes anyway, but you know, it's like 20 some kids and it's just like pandemonium. And I'm just like, oh, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know? because you, you know, I've gotten away from it. Like, ask me that, you know, 30 years ago when I had four kids in the house myself, where it was pandemonium every day, and you're just used to it. I mean, yeah. it just rolls off your back, and you don't pay any attention to it. But then, when your kids grow up and leave the nest, and you have grandkids, but you only see them for a little bit, and then they they go away. And you, you know, so I get it. It's kind of like, I don't, I don't know if I could be here for two hours. You know, I might, yeah. I might go crazy, you know, just with the noise and the activity because you're not used to it. I, I'm just impressed though, that you said that there were about 20 kids last week. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised. Yeah, there was two missing. It should have been 22. Yeah. And there's actually, it's interesting, a lot more kids come on Wednesday night than on Sunday morning. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, but yeah, Matt, I mean, I think last week we had, Matt had 15 youth um, wow. on a Wednesday night. And that didn't, and there were several that would be what he would consider consistent, you know, regular attenders who weren't there. So, like, I mean, that's a, um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing, really. Chastity sent me some pictures that I'll be putting yeah. on. Mm -hmm. So that was really nice of you to meal. Um, I, I like what it, an example they say, or, or, or a point that you want to get to in your church. It's on 295, the bottom of the page. Our church tracks but now statements. Like you could hear that down the road for us. We used to have only adults in front of the church, but now we invite the youth to participate. We used to have only adults in the choir, but now we would love the teenagers to join us. You know, we used to do this, but now we do this. And that's what you want to get to, to where people are excited about the 
but nails. Yeah. And I like the way they phrase that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting too, because it, um, I was actually in a talk, Christy Johnson, who's over the IDA, whose kid, sons, Cole and Eli, come to youth sign. I don't know if they were there last night. Um, and they come, they, they only come to worship when they're acolyted, which is interesting to me. Well, they're sitting over there. They normally sit, yeah, they normally sit over there by the window. And she's got a little a little boy that's probably three now, too. Um, but she was talking, so I mean, you know, she's over the IDA, so she goes to the Board of Supervisor meetings and the school board meetings. And she said that, you know, she's from Halifax County, but if you were an outsider, you would not think anything positive is ever going on in Halifax County because the only it's people that speak, it's only negative, and like that's what always gets rid of in the paper, too. And she just wished. That people like you know when something good happens and she said it doesn't even need to be a major thing just go to the meeting and like say i'm so glad that x happened or something like that because she said there are a lot of small things and that you'd be surprised that what is a different because you know she deals with companies that might want to locate you know some part of their operation here and she said that you know it's not really the the schools themselves that are a hindrance to bringing companies it's the press that the schools get and like the comments that people make and like the impression that creates, which might not be realistic, you know. Oh, I like so yeah, and you know, I, I think like that. One hundred percent. I wonder too, like in church. I mean, I think churches. It's very easy to get cynical about things or to be pessimistic, and like you might dwell on the negatives and just keep talking about, you know. I think it, like the language we use to describe things is very important, and like you can. Most of the time, like you can tell, you can tell a. A sad story or you can think about how to tell it in a positive way too you know and it does have an effect like i mean i think my main takeaway from this book is that before you can change anything it's culture that really is what drives change and what helps you create a warm congregation where this type of work is possible especially the type of work that allows you to encourage resistance and to, and to slowly help people recognize the benefit of something that maybe they weren't in favor of to begin with um, and I think like it, it's it's stuff like that, like these little leverage the power of small wins. It's being able to be consistent and in, in, in being able to tell that story and to, to make sure that you market, for lack of a better word, you know, the good things you are doing and the progress you are making. I mean, you know, like like Sarah, you just said, I mean, like it's pretty remarkable that a year ago we had no youth group and have not had a youth group for a year. And Matt's been around for about six months now. And between, and, and Chastity, Chastity is a big part of this too. But because of their efforts, there are now like 20 some kids coming on Wednesday nights for Bible study. Like that's phenomenal, you know. I that's mean, that sentence. Yeah. The young, energetic, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a magnet, it draws them. Yeah. And, you know. When we were just discussing about about the meals earlier and you know what a wonderful thing that we have that number coming but then I commented because right now you know we're just kind of figuring out how to move forward with with you know giving them a, a meal before they start because they're starving and hungry and I said okay it's 2022 20, kids right now but I said, suppose next week, each one of them brought a friend. Yeah. You're at 44. Suppose everybody has such a good time. A couple months after that, each one of them has brought a friend. I mean, pretty soon your youth group can be a very huge part of this church. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. You know, it's exponential. Now you're way something to, to share your favorite part of something. Yeah. So you get them in. And they're a part of the service, a few that might be willing to be a part of the service. You know, everybody might not, but maybe they'll come support the others that Sunday. And find yes, out. they could be encouraged. Just oh, come and sit and encourage because, you know, we've mentioned Candace. I mean, Candace is like Tigger. I mean, <laughs> her energy is infectious and her, so, I've never seen her not with so a smile on her face. Next group next Wednesday, which has can invite them to come hear the three girls participate. That would be, yeah, that'd be a form. fabulous come idea. support them, please, yes. and yeah. see if that. Well, and I mean, I think it's an interesting great. conversation to have with the kids, too. I mean, if you've got 20-some youth that are on Wednesday night that, that you might see 
five or ten of them at the most on Sunday mornings, have a conversation with them on a Wednesday night about what would they like to see on Sunday morning? Like what would make them feel more included or what would excite, you know, I mean, you know, and, and what would motivate them to get up to come? To yeah, church? yeah. I mean, you know, like what is it that makes, you know, I mean, and you might get answers that, you know, anytime you work with young people, you get some interesting thoughts, but, um, but yeah, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I think, and that's like a big thing it talks about, right? Is listening. Like you, if you want to grow young, you don't start by like throwing darts at the board and hoping one six, right? Like you, you intentionally listen, right? About what, where is God at work in our own lives, in our congregation, in our community? What does it look like for us to faithfully join God in those places, right? Um, well, I was going to say he could tie into his lesson or devotion, not only getting feedback from them about maybe they think church is somewhere formal and stuck up where I just go have to sit for an hour and it will be boring and whatever they might think if they've never been to church before. Yeah. But I mean, this is my personal opinion is that he also ought to be teaching them about the Sabbath and like yeah. what Sunday is for and Sunday is, you know, for a time to come and worship Yeah, and worship can take many forms and then, you know, encourage them to come when there are young people that they can see in the choir that might speak, like read the scripture, whatever they might do. Yeah. Um, well, and I think it's important to have a conversation, and I think we don't we don't do this enough with adults either. But like, the objective of worship is not entertainment, right? Like, you right. know, I mean, it's worship is the objective in and of itself, right? So, like, with a young person, if you can have those conversations about why we do things a certain way, we do why we've done them historically that way. Um, you know, I mean, I think a, a big issue facing all churches is that we're very like consumerist culture, and like. You know the church's entertainment is a part of that like it's something you consume and i think you know the two ways you work against that ensure against the, that's not the culture you're creating is to have conversations about what worship is for but also to i mean getting young people involved in the service themselves where they're not just consuming worship they're mm -hmm. participating in it mm -hmm. um and then you know not just participating but understanding well, when we do an invocation, why do we do that? And when I light the candles as an acolyte, what, what am I doing? Or, you know, why do we do things the way that we do? Um, to me, that's the, um, I, I think that's a, a something that all churches, especially ours, could do a better job at. Um, well, I, I wanted to share this with you guys too. We invited Matt to speak at our um, Roots and Club specifically to talk about young life yeah. and what it was for and you know how we might participate in helping in some way and uh, he brought Candace and another young man with him and Candace kind of gave her testimony about how she didn't feel like she fit in with a lot of the people her age yeah. and that going to young life uh, helped her um, and, and she just talked about developing a relationship with the Lord. You know, having a young person get up and give their personal testimony, yeah. having an old person give a personal uh -huh. testimony. You know, we used to do some of that occasionally, particularly when we were trying to uh, maybe increase stewardship. Somebody would talk about how tithing had been a blessing in their life. Yeah. But I think you could have them, anybody of any age, on a Sunday morning, could yeah. give a two-minute talk about what this church means to me, about what right. my how my relationship with Christ has grown. You know, there are the friendships you've made. Yeah, yes. you've received in times of trouble. Oh, like, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. I think that would be a really neat thing. And like you say, you're just talking two or three minutes. Yeah. And we, and one of the things that I tell to my grief share people is how important my church was to me when Jennifer passed. And I will never, ever forget the Sunday that we read off the names of the people who had died that year. And I'm sitting in the choir and I'm thinking, I don't know if I can do this. And you were on one side of me and Brenda Powell was on the other side of me. And when they started reading the names, you each 
took my hand. Mm -hmm. Well, my first thought was, what if I start crying? What am I going <laughs> to do? <laughs> but but y'all were there and y'all realized this is not going to be easy for her. Yeah. And that was really important. And it made me feel loved and supported. Yeah. Well, I, you know, um, I don't know if you remember, you know, the, the deacons doing the welcome now, but when Violet Neal did it for the first time, it's probably been six months or so ago now. But, you know, Violet's been a member of this church for a long time. And, you know, it's very important to her parents as well. And Violet, even within that, like, two-minute welcome mentioned about, you know, went back and how welcoming and supportive and important this church had been to her mm -hmm. over all of her years, through all of the challenges that she had faced. And her welcome is that, I hope, if you're a guest with us, that you'll, it'll be just as welcoming and supporting and loving to you. I mean, like, that was, I mean, I remember calling Violet that Tuesday or something and saying, I, I'm in favor of you doing that every Sunday. And it, was, you know, it was just so, it was. you know, most I, people, I remember, I even, remember that. Even when I do it, you know, it's like, there's definitely not that intention that goes, but that was like, it was so wonderful. And, you know, I mean, it was just, um, yeah, and it was two minutes, right? Like, I mean, and, um, Candace, if there's, there's a, a youth children's Sunday at the end of March, and I think Candace is going to be the speaker is what we think right now. So, and I think it is that, her testimony, you know. Okay, so well, you'll, you'll, you'll have to work with her. work with reining her in on <laughs> time. time. Yeah, that's fine. Because she tended to go on and on and, and and that's not bad, but I mean, you know, on a Sunday morning. People get hungry at about, about 11.50. <laughs> and you, know, you need talking. to say whatever the number of minutes, whether it's 10 yeah. minutes yeah. or, you know, whatever, just say plan something and then practice, practice yeah. your time. Well, what, what we did with Mary Maloney and Matt, and Matt preached after Christmas, is that the agreement was the week before they had to have it ready. And then we came in here and practiced it and mm -hmm. timed yeah, it and then figured important. out, you know, what what worked well and where was there some areas that we could grow a little bit and practice it again, and, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it turned out well for both of them. They both did a good job. So. And that would, that's the plan, you know, Candace as well. Good. Um, but you, well, are there any final thoughts about growing young? One, one thing that I thought was really interesting, and I don't know exactly what page it was on, but it, it talks about, um, yeah, so it's the bottom of 294, top of 295. So like how to maintain disciplined attention. So to keep working, to, to grow, I guess, you know, to become more inclusive and welcoming and warm. And the first thing was, develop a growing young team and start meeting. And, you know, it would be that team that would be in charge of this process of listening to the congregation and listening to young people and, and figuring out what our story is and how we can tell that story and how, you know, we can help people recognize their role in that story as well. I thought that would be a neat idea for the church, you know. And meet three or four weeks, it said, like, it's not just a one-time thing. Oh, it says meet every three or four. Was it, was it meet? Oh, meet every three or four weeks. Three oh, four I was weeks, reading yeah. it as meet four, three yeah. or four weeks. Yeah, like meet every, every three, three to four weeks. Yeah. So, I mean, you think, like once a month. You think, like, what is a, well, and they probably meet more frequently than that, but, like, when, you, when you're looking for a new pastor, right, like that's a very intentional process, and it's, it's not a quick process, nor should it be. Um, but a big part of that is, what's the history of our congregation? Where's our congregation at currently? Where would we like? Where would the congregation itself like to go? What are they looking for in a minister? It's this whole process of yes. learning our story, listening to the congregation, and then once you've got this information, figuring out what our next steps are. Who's the right candidate? What's our profile, etc. Um, and I mean, to me, like that's the that's the important work here. It's we need to do something, but we need to be smart about what we do. And, and you know, there's a lot of other moving parts that'll help us support that work, right? Um, so I thought, you know, I thought it was a really interesting book. Um, I thought it helped me think about it a lot of, of, of interesting questions and have ideas that, you know, um, I really enjoyed it. So. I hope you have as well. Yes, and one more thing on page yeah. 295, that treating failure as a door to learning, yeah. great organizations fail frequently. 
the key is not to avoid making mistakes, but to learn from those mistakes as quickly as you yeah. can. You know, we have to be realistic in that way. Right. I want to say one more thing. Um, I want to say that I think, and maybe it was just the pastor search committee, but I think that it was a big step for this church to call you as a young minister. Oh, yeah. Because ever since I've been here, with the exception of Mark Olson, they've all been pretty old. <laughs> Not real old, but you know, 50 ish. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So I think that was a it was a it was, it was a, an open door to we we it see was a specific aim. Yes. We see for us that yeah. we need some younger ideas and some energy yeah. and I think you've done a wonderful job, and I want to say thank you. Well, for I appreciate it. And I know it's been, that it, a lot of it's been hard, and COVID yeah. has made it next to impossible to do your job. <laughs> well, you know, I think it, it, that was a big concern, and, and it wasn't necessarily for the congregation for me. Um, and I've told, I've told her this, but my big concern coming in was how Susan would respond, because I, you know, I didn't know Susan. And I could just imagine, here's somebody that has been in ministry for 30 years, been at this church for 25 years, uh, she's been in ministry for longer than I have been in alive at that point. You know, like how would she respond to me coming in as the senior pastor? So, like, I mean, I remember my my visit weekend when I, you know, when, when I had the sermon preached in Louisville Call, like having the conversation. Well, that was one of the questions I asked because I was really concerned. And um, you know, I would say I could not have. I, I just can't imagine having. A staff member that could be any more supportive or encouraging or better to work with than Susan has been. Like, I mean, I, I just, um, and I like, I know myself well enough to know that if I was in her shoes, I would certainly not have been as gracious as she has been over the, you know, I mean, it just, I, I don't have that kind of personality. So, um, but you know, I mean, I think it has been a wonderful congregation. And my, my church in Greensboro was a wonderful congregation in its way, too. I think to, to recognize that I was young and that everything wouldn't be perfect because I was trying to learn and um, the support and the encouragement, even amidst all the difficulty of the last, you know, two years now. Um, I mean, I couldn't imagine being in a better place, you know, at this stage in my career. Um, You've won people over. Well, <laughs> and, and a lesser person might have thrown in the towel and run away. Well, there's been plenty of times when I've thought about it. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, uh, but no, I mean, well, call you know, me first. Well, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, Say, I need a life jacket. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, they have, I think Tony Brooks told Bill they've got 19 vacancies. Oh, it's more than that. He's got 30. But it, maybe it's more now. He's because got 30 churches. And right pastors. Like sister for what we can and his area. In Tony the, Brooks. Yeah. Pastors that have retired early or just even retired even at a younger age because unlike teachers like teachers wow. cbf back in the late summer did this cbf global did this thing where they paid for retreats in every state for ministers to go to and, you know it was free of charge and, um but, you know they had uh, the term now is spiritual coach so it's kind of like if your therapist was a pastor i guess <laughs> That would meet with you for like an hour, you know, one day. And, and and anyway, it was a guy that had been a pastor at First Baptist in Salem for like 25 years, and he was retired, probably 65. Um, and he was, you know, I was just telling him how hard it had been. <laughs> he was telling me that, you know, all of his friends that were still in ministry that were, you know, probably 60 and above, they all were out the door. He said oh. that, he, he, you know, he's like every week I get another phone call with somebody that, you know, two years ago was planning on working until 65, 70, maybe that, you know, they've talked with their financial advisor and they figured out what they need to do to be able to get out and they're done. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think that, I think that it's good that this church recognized the need to call a young pastor, because I think if you look at the demographics of pastors, probably a, a scary percentage are between, let's just say 55 and 70, which means five to 10 years from now, there's going to be this great exodus and there's not people to replace them unless you draw from younger people, right? Um, and I think it's important 
I think it's important to find ways to encourage young clergy. I mean, you know, I mean, I knew going into Greensboro that I didn't want to be a youth minister for my whole life. I knew I wanted to be a pastor, and, and they knew that about me as well. And they were very intentional, and, and the pastor was very intentional in giving me space to grow, not just as a youth minister, but as a, 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 a pastor, somebody that wanted to be a pastor. And that's not always the case. And I think that that, like, I have been very blessed in my life from the time I was in youth group, when I was in college, when I was in seminary in my first church in Greensboro, now here. I have always been in environments where there were people that were willing to let me take chances and to grow and to encourage me. And also to tell me like, you know, you're being a little bit boneheaded here. You've got to, you've got to do better, right? Like, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've been able to grow up in that environment and like, I, I can't tell you how thankful I am because that's not everybody's experience. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think that's a testimony to this church, too, because not there's not a lot of churches, I think, that, you know, that would it'd be more of a challenge for them, you know, um, than I think it has been here. But, but anyway, I'm kind of rambling back, so, um, which is one thing I tend to do. Um, but, yeah, so I will say I'm, I'm not going to do another book club, probably maybe in the fall we can reassess whether we want to do another one. Um, and my reasoning for that is twofold. Um, based on some thoughts from this book, uh, starting in March, one Wednesday night a month, initially at least, um, I'm going to start doing something with parents that coincides with youth and children's activities. So the thought would be that if the youth and children are eating, maybe the parents eat as well. But then when they go their own way, youth and children, the parents will come with me and we can talk about, you know, what our hopes are for our youth and children here, like how we can be supportive of them, what what would they like more guidance on, things like that. Like how can we minister specifically to parents? Um, and then another thing we're gonna be doing in March, building up to April, is um, during the Sunday school hour, meeting with the youth and, and maybe the fourth and fifth grade children um, doing what, what I'm going to call faith and formation class. So it's going to be what I'll call the salvation story. So from creation to the fall to attempts at redemption to the cross to what does this mean now, right? Like learning the story of salvation and our part in it. But then also like why we do the things we do as a Baptist church, right? Like about baptism, so like a baptism class, maybe something like that. And the hope, the hope is that on Easter, if we have any young people that would like to be baptized that as part of our Easter service, we'd have a baptism. Oh, wonderful. So, so that was my, I really enjoyed the book club and look forward to it, but I, I would, I think it's time for me maybe to focus a little bit more energy in these areas. So um, the idea of once a month inviting the parents instead of just pulling up and letting their kids jump out, inviting them to come in and have a meal and then talk and instead of them having to drive home and then turn come back and pick them up like just stay yeah you know that's i have something to say about that a good idea of how sure. the youth from that can just come all kinds of branches oh yeah of, you know of next reaching your parents yeah. so, and and doing it once a month i think is not too it's not day. too much yeah yeah because we talked about it in um the youth and children's advisory committee meeting. And, and I mean, I would be open to doing it twice a month, but I, I, I certainly don't want to create like something else that somebody has to do. Like I want it to be something they want to do. So, you know, maybe it will turn into more than once a month, but I don't think it would ever be like a weekly thing. So, uh, but yeah. Well, I, I've really appreciated the time we've been able to spend together over the last, you know, few months talking about this book. And I hope it's been um, beneficial to you. And, uh, but anyway, I'm going to close this out. Most gracious God, we thank you again, um, Lord, for the time you've given us just to discuss how we can join you in the work that you're doing in our congregation, especially among our young people and their families. Lord, we just pray that in all things we would be attentive to you, Lord, that we would be faithful to the call that you place on our lives as individuals and as a congregation, Lord, and that we would seek not only to share, I mean, to receive the love, Lord, that you give to us in your son, Jesus Christ, but to share it with others as well. Um, God, we pray 
for our young people, for our youth and children, and for our young families as well. Lord, we know how difficult the past few years have been for them with COVID, and we just know how difficult life is in general for everyone, Lord. So we just pray, Lord, that we would be more attentive to their needs and more willing to do whatever we can to minister to them um, during this important chapter of their lives. Lord, we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.